Uh, I know lunchtime's coming up. Sometimes it's tempting to get in a queue early, so I really appreciate people kind of sitting in for the last session before lunch. Um, before I start, I won't be taking questions at the end, but I'll hang around in the corridor afterwards if anybody wants to talk to me about anything about the talk. That's, that's great. Uh, but before I introduce the topic of this talk, uh, first I'd like to, like to talk about one of my favorite things. Uh, this is me. Uh, I'm a developer advocate at Nexmo. Uh, we're one of the conference sponsors. Uh, I also run Edinburgh's Python user group in Scotland. Uh, I'm GG2K on Twitter. Feel free to tweet me. Uh, same on GitHub and some other things. And um, if you've heard of me before, it's because I've got a bit of a reputation for writing gleefully terrible Python code and then showing it to anybody who will listen. Um, so working at Nexmo, I work in our developer relations team. And my job, we're, we're a, a service provider. We provide REST APIs for uh, telecoms, uh, sending and receiving SMS messages and making phone calls. And my job there is on the edge of engineering. It's to talk to customers, talk to the, the developers using our products, um, and find out the problems they're having, the things that are going well, um, what they'd like, what frustrates them, and then try and feed that back into the product. Um, so I, spend a lot, I, I maintain our Python and Java libraries, um, and I maintain an unofficial Go library that I wrote last year that I'm hoping to make official at some point soon. Um, and I spend a lot of time thinking about what makes customers happy. Um, and a lot of that is actually stability. Um, so while I was writing this talk, which was initially, well, it's still called Pythonic Refactoring, um, I realized that it wasn't really a talk about refactoring. If you're interested in refactoring, I highly recommend this book. Uh, it's got 72 refactoring recipes in it, uh, so it's kind of difficult to hold the whole thing in your head. Um, and it's very Java-centric. If there's a reason you haven't read it, it's probably because you opened it up and found a whole load of Java code. But it does contain a lot of good general advice. Uh, but the main theme of the book is to be prepared to change your code all the time, over time, uh, to clean it up and allow new architect uh, architectures to emerge. What it's not really about is whether you're breaking your user's code. Uh, it assumes really you're the, the customer and the developer of your product. Um, so you kind of control both sides. And in many cases, that's not the case. So this talk is really about library, ma library maintenance. It assumes you have a library that's been released, and you have two or more users. Oh, uh, that means that any changes you make to your interface, anytime you break compatibility, um, it's a one-to-many problem. And the more users you've got, the bigger problem it is. And a really good example of kind of uh, what this looks like is Python itself. So the standard library very rarely changes. Things are added to it. Very few things actually change, because there are thousands and thousands of users of Python and the standard library. And every time they break backwards compatibility, that causes problems for people, slows down adoption. Look at Python 3. So batteries included is kind of not the best model anymore. It's really, like, essentially, when you've got a, a released library, um, you want, want it to be additions uh, and internal fixes. You don't want to have to re-architect the thing. But when you do need to change things, ideally, you need to hide the changes from your users. So it's about allowing changes when your customers are important to you. So we talk about ensuring that our interface is stable. Why would you want to have a stable interface? So I've kind of touched on this already. It, it means that you have happier users. Um, users like to upgrade the libraries without things breaking. And it's in your interest to keep people up to date in your libraries, because then you're not maintaining all the releases. You're not getting bugs reported on versions that you don't really support anymore. Um, but ultimately, the reason you want happier customers and you want people to upgrade um, is so that your library survives. And I'll interchangeably use words like customers and products and all the rest of it, but it applies equally to open source projects. Um, if you don't maintain a certain level of stability, if people can't upgrade, if they have to rewrite their code just to upgrade to, a, a, to get minor improvements, um, that is an opportunity for them to look at other libraries that fill the same space and maybe, maybe jump ship, switch libraries. So if you want your library to survive, it's really important to have an agreement with your customers that you're going to maintain a certain level of stability. Libraries only survive if they're stable. So the talk's in two parts. And the first part is less technical, and it's more about the project management style things you can do when you're managing your library. And it's not hugely Python specific. But the second part is a handful of tricks, things that you can do that are Pythonic, um, that allow you to make changes at the edge of your interface 
um, without actually breaking compatibility with your users. So if we're going to talk about stability in our interface, the first question we really need to ask ourselves is, what is our interface? What should that look like? And I think of it as being, as I said before, the boundary of our code. It's where your user uses your code. It's the part of the code that, if it changes, the user will be affected in negative ways. And in Python, the boundary of our code is particularly broad and complex. And I'll show you why. But we'll just break this down. Our interface consists of modules, obviously, because usually our, our users will pip install our library and then import a module, at least one. And that module will contain classes and functions and methods. And when we're looking at this in a shallow way, kind of that's it. That's, that's what our interface looks like, right? But digging in a bit deeper, our functions take parameters. If we change the, uh, the signature of our functions, then we're going to break compatibility. Uh, we have global variables that people rely on. If we change the types of those, if we change the names of those, we're going to break compatibility. Uh, we have exceptions, which I think people don't think about enough. Um, exceptions are thrown from deep in our code right to the user's code. And they can choose to ignore that. I mean, that can result in a crash in the application, and, and that's, that's a relatively standard approach uh, in lots of, lots of Python software. Um, but if they are catching it, they may be catching a certain type. So if the type of your exception changes, if your type hierarchy changes, if your name of your exception changes, sometimes even if the message that, uh, that you, that you uh, put into the exception changes, you can break the user's code. Structure, this is about moving code around, so you might not be changing signatures or whatever, but you might move it from one submodule, move a function from one submodule to another. That again is going to break compatibility if the user is relying on that function, even if they're not supposed to, even if they just found the function and thought, hey, that's what I was looking for, and it's not, it's not part of what you consider to be your public interface, that's going to cause problems. And just to really, this is a stupid example, but just to demonstrate kind of how much of a problem this is in Python, even your bytecode is something that your user can get at. There's a decorator that a friend of mine, Sebastian Noack, wrote that went kind of viral on Hacker News a couple of years ago that allows you to decorate a function, and it disassembles the bytecode from the function, allows you to use a go-to keyword in the function to jump between operations, um, and then it reassembles it again into a valid Python object. So if somebody doing something like disassembling your bytecode and then messing around with it, and they make, they've made some assumptions of the structure of the bytecode, potentially even just changing an if statement or a for loop or something could break the client code. That's not something you need to worry about, but it's just that an example of how transparent Python is, how much you can get at everything. So ideally, your interface should be as strict as possible. In an ideal world, I think of it as something like this kid's toy. Um, so you've got these walls. And in the walls, you've got, you've got these gaps that you can put things through. These are functions or classes. And you pass well-defined objects through. They're the only things that fit through that gap. They get validated on the way. And then you call the function, and the code is uh, executed. And then well-defined, stable objects come back again. And ideally, it's impossible to refer to classes, methods, functions, or variables that aren't exposed by this interface. And even if you're not publishing your library externally, even if you don't have sort of customers that you don't really speak to, um, internally, this is how you should be structuring your code. You should have stable-ish stable interfaces between all of the different components of your, your own software. Now, Python's not really like this. There are some things that are a bit like this. And I suspect there'll be a few sniggers <laughs> wincing when, when you see this list. Um, and they're not libraries. They are distributed systems protocols. Um, and these things are much more like what we're talking about. So J2EE, for example, when you build a, at least a traditional J2EE application, you have three libraries. You have a server library, a client library, and then you have a shared library that contains the objects that can be passed between the two systems. The client code has no access to anything else in the server because they have to use this shared library to, to even talk to the server. Um, uh, REST does the same kind of thing with OpenAPI. Um, SOAP had WSDL files, um, Corba, I think, had IDL files, but these are old. I mean, I put the dates in there because I was actually surprised by how old REST is. It's 17 years old, so people have been thinking about these things for a while. Corba is 26 years old. But Python's not like this. Um, let's have a look at something we can do with Python. I'm going to show you a whole load of bad techniques. Don't do this. Uh, so I've got two lines of code here. The first one imports requests, very common, commonly used library. 
Uh, and then we're just listing the things inside the request module. And we've got a whole bunch of things there, and I've just highlighted a few things. We've got this thing called loader. I've no idea what that is, but it looks special because it's got a double underscore at the start at the end. Um, there's something private, internal utils. We know it's private because it has a single underscore at the start of the name. Um, we've got a submodule comp called compat. Uh, we've got a function called get. Um, I think modules is another submodule. Um, but it's just a, a whole bag of stuff, and we can play with them. So we can import requests. Uh, I've defined a function called stupid requests that really doesn't do anything except print out a message. Um, but then I can mutate the request library that I've imported. So I can assign to get, I can replace the get function inside requests with my own function. And then anywhere else in my process where I import requests, I get the modified requests object. I've messed up my whole application. If I call get now, it doesn't matter what I pass in. It just prints out, don't be stupid, and it doesn't do anything. So Python allows you to do this kind of thing. I mean, ideally, your user is not going to do this, but it just shows that, that, that all bets are off. So what we would like is something like this, something with a tough shell It's difficult to break through, only gives you access to things on its terms. But Python isn't like that. Python is a box of Lego. You can pick up bits of it, you can take them apart, you can put them together in a different way and then put them back in the box. Um, so what we really need to do is kind of build our own hard-shelled animal with the toys that we've been given. And the main, th the, the main way we do that is through communication. So what we really need to do is make our interface knowable. Um, so because we can't, we've already said, like, the, cust the customer can do anything, so we, and we, we can't stop them. So what we want to do is have an agreement with them that they won't do these things. So they need to know what they should and shouldn't be doing, and then they know what guarantees they get if they follow those rules. So we get a few things for free in Python. We've got conventions. So we have the underscore prefix that I mentioned before. So here I've got a class. It's got a, a method in there with a, sing we know, with a private method in there. We know it's private because it starts with a single underscore. It doesn't change anything. Um, the last line of code in here is calling that method from outside. Now, we shouldn't do that, um, but it works anyway. It doesn't change anything. Um, and we should do this a lot. Like, we, we should, we, anything that we consider to be private that our users shouldn't use, um, prefix them with a single underscore, uh, that's good. What we shouldn't do is this. And you see this sometimes in um, beginner Python developers' code, uh, where they've just learned that there's this technique. Sometimes there's blog posts online that advise this kind of thing. Um, if you prefix your method with a double underscore, um, that makes it difficult to call. It doesn't make it private. It doesn't stop you from being able to call it. So you'll see it's called can't touch this with a double underscore. But when I call it, it's prefixed with the class name and a single underscore. Um, so Python just changes the name of it. And it's not meant to make it difficult to call. It's not meant to make it private. It's meant to avoid naming conflicts in subclasses. So it's by sticking a double underscore on this method, you're actually telling the user the wrong thing. You're telling them it's private, whereas in fact it, it's not. It, I mean, it's still an internal detail, but it's specifically for subclass uh, name clashes. Uh, so don't use them to create private attributes unless you specifically have this problem. And then thirdly, as a general technique for coding in Python, for uh, avo avoiding your users uh, touching your private code, um, put all your, all your internal code into a submodule. Um, and then, and you see this quite a lot in libraries. So they'll have a submodule where really all the work's done, uh, and then the public interface is in a top mo top level module, and everything's just imported into that. And it's great from a user's perspective because if they decide to just investigate the module by running dir on the module that they've just imported, they just get a list of the things that they should be using. They don't even see anything beginning with a single underscore or anything like that that that, that um, may intrigue them and encourage them to dig further. Um, and that submodule, which contains all the code, you can prefix that with a single underscore to imply to the user that they shouldn't be using, um, using that code. Documentation is more expensive but infinitely valuable in terms of creating an agreement with your user. So it's the primary way you communicate with your users. And the Python ecosystem has excellent documentation. We're really lucky in this community that we care about documentation. Most of the modules we use are well documented in a human way. If you, if you read the documentation, they will have an introduction, they will have good reference documentation, but also they'll kind of guide you through the code, through the interface that you're supposed to be using. And I, I think the reason, and, and it spawned the Read the Docs conferences, they, that primarily comes from the Python community. Um, and 
I think the reason our community has learned that documentation is so important is because we've learned that users will use the interface that we document. And if we don't write document, documentation, users will actually read our code. And that's not something any of us want. If you don't write documentation, users will guess the interface. They really don't have a choice. And they'll get it wrong. So they will use parts of your code that, they don't, that you don't want them to. So when writing documentation, I advise using Sphinx or MakeDocs, if you prefer uh, Markdown. Um, don't auto-generate your documentation. Don't use Epidoc. Um, to, to just sort of extract every function in a long list um, and, and whatever doc strings you have for those. Um, think about your, your documentation as something that's kind of guiding your users to how they should use your library. And finally, to halfway between the documentation and the code is type hints. Um, so I know it's relatively controversial. It's a new feature in the language. It doesn't change the behavior of Python if you add type hints, but it allows you to annotate parameters, variables, return values with type information about what's expected or what will be returned from functions. And the IDEs use it. PyCharm especially uses it to communicate information to your users. It prompts them to use the right variable types when they're passing things in and out of your library. And we're experimenting with them, with them in the next MoPython library, uh, and we still really have to come to a conclusion on whether, whether they're worth the the effort of maintenance. Um, but so far, it's looking pretty good. They communicate typing assumptions to users. So they're creating a shared understanding, which is really what this is all about. So in answer to the original question, what is your interface, um, the answer really is code that's documented. So now we've sold what our interface is made up of. Um, and now our users, our users know which parts of our library they're supposed to use, or they're allowed to use. They're oblivious of the code that they're not supposed to use because it's not documented. And because the documentation is so good, they have no reason to dig into the code and find the stuff that they're not supposed to use. So now that we've got an agreement, a, pro a set of promises uh, in terms of stability with our customers, we have to stop ourselves from breaking those promises. And we do that through testing. There's this quote that I quite like, uh, code without tests is broken by design. Um, and it's attributed to Jacob Kaplan Moss uh, from the Django uh, Foundation. And, uh, but he denies ever having said it. So uh, I've, but I've attributed, it to, attributed it to Anonymous instead. Um, but I like, a, I like to, create, to think of a corollary of this, which is that if you're not testing your interface, then you don't have an interface. So there's this relatively standard diagram that you see when people talk about testing, and they're really talking about how, what types of tests you should write and how much of each type you should write. And the, the idea is that you should write lots of unit tests because they're easy and cheap to write, um, and they're quick to run and relatively reliable. And as you go up the pyramid, you should be writing fewer and fewer of those until you get to manual tests, which you really don't, I, you know, in an ideal world, you wouldn't have any, but they offer some value. So um, there's some use, but as few as possible, as specific as possible. And I feel like interface tests kind of sit in the middle here. They're, they're similar to integration tests. Um, and you should probably have a similar amount of tests in terms of your interfaces. And I suspect most of us who are maintaining libraries actually already have a set of these tests. Um, but we just don't separate them out. We, we bucket them in one of these, these extra ca these other categories. Um, but I think there's some real value in terms of extracting your interface tests out into their own space. Because then you know that if you're changing one of your interface tests or removing one of your interface tests, that you've, that you've broken compatibility. And then you need to communicate that to your users, that they're going to have to change their code when they upgrade. And how do you communicate that you're, you've intentionally broken compatibility? Initially, there's versioning, uh, which is quite straightforward. I think most people are using semantic versioning these days, uh, except for potentially some older projects that, that kind of received these, these ideas gaining wide adoption. Um, but the, and it's very simple. The, the basic idea is you have three version numbers, major, minor, and patch. And if the major number changes, then um, it's a backwards incompatible upgrade. Um, minor changes are usually additions or backwards compatible changes. Um, so they may be changes to the interface, but they're backwards compatible. And patches shouldn't, shouldn't break anybody's code at all. On top of that, there's release notes. So uh, this website is really good, keepchangelog.com. Uh, they recommend keeping a markdown file of your release notes, which I suspect most people are doing these days anyway. But they also recommend for each release that you make, you separate the changes out into these six categories. So things that are added, changed, deprecated, removed, or um, bug fixes and security fixes. And the ones we're interested in here are changed and removed. If you have those in a release, then you've probably broken compatibility and you need a major version bump. 
And I think it's worth noting that it is okay to break compatibility, but it's also worth noting that you shouldn't be doing it all the time. So I work very hard to try and bundle up backwards incompatible changes into a, you know, a big release. Um, so that we're not drip feeding backwards incompatible changes all the time. We don't want people to, every time they upgrade, have to change their code. Um, even if it's just one line or two lines, it just means people then don't rely on the process of upgrading. It means they don't upgrade. Um, but yeah, so bundle your changes together. If you can, um, try to maintain multiple releases at the same time so that you can keep, keep things moving forwards. Um, and add and deprecate instead of modifying things, if you can. So then once you've deprecated, you need a deprecation policy. I like Django's, which is that they deprecate an, in a minor release, and then they remove the changes in the next major release, unless it was very recent. Um, but whatever it is that you choose, stick to the deprecation policy. It is worth removing code from your project every so often, because ultimately that's cruft and it's extra code you have to maintain. Um, use the warnings module. Um, with deprecation warnings, so that if people run their code with the, the minus WD flag, they'll see deprecation warnings. They'll start to realize that they're going to need to make changes to their code before that stuff disappears. So the real theme of this so far, and I'm afraid it's a bit boring, is good engineering practices protect your users from change. Documentation, testing, and versioning. Those are the things that you really need to keep on top of um, if your, your users are going to trust you. So that's the first part of the talk. And we're now moving into some technical stuff. So I've got a few patterns. Um, I've followed roughly the format of the refactoring book for each one of these. So I've given each one a name, and then we've looked at, uh, we're going to look at some code and um, the changes we want to make and the problems in the way, and essentially some Pythonic solutions to those. So the first one is replacing an object attribute with a property. I suspect we've all done this. But it's a nice, simple start. So imagine we've got this class. I've got a, uh, this is uh, purposefully stupid. Um, so we have a module used for encryption, and it has a value in there that's important to people implementing this encryption algorithm. It's got a salt, and it's always four, because four is a very secure value. But then your requirements change. Let's just say you hadn't read the specification properly. Uh, and instead, it's actually, that salt is not supposed to be for. It's supposed to be the current time when the encryption was performed. Um, so we have a problem now, which is we really want to replace salt with a method. Uh, but we can't replace it with a method without breaking backwards compatibility, because methods have to be called. You access salt and then call it. That's different from just accessing salt and using the value. As I say, this is a simple example. I suspect we've all done it. Uh, so yes, we use the property decorator. And this is what the solution looks like. Um, we implement our method, we call it salt, and then we stick the property decorator on the start. And now, whenever this is ac uh, accessed as an attribute, um, it will return the current time, so a different time each time, which is great. Uh, so the basic gist here is that we've been able to swap out a static value for a dynamic value. We've been able to swap out a variable for a method without changing our interface, which is awesome. And you can't do this in languages like Java. So another example here is singletons and factories. Um, an example I have is this config object. Um, and the idea is that you instantiate it with a path, and then you have an object containing some config. And you'll see I've created two objects at the bottom um, from the same path, but they're different objects. And that could potentially be a problem. So if you, if you modify one of those, um, then actually it's not going it, to be reflected in the other object, because they're two separate instances. Um, so really, we want a pool of objects. We want a config object that's kind of looked up by its path, and if it's already been loaded, it will return the existing object. Now, in the refactoring book, this pattern is called replace constructor with factory method, um, specifically because Java, you can't, in Java you can't change the instantiation of objects, the way that they're constructed. But we can. We can implement new, which is not very common, but it's, that's what you do when you want to change the instantiation of objects. So this is called before init. Um, and it returns the object that will actually be initialized. Um, so and normally, it creates a new object and then returns it. So we, and that's the behavior we usually expect. But in this case, um, we can implement it um, with an if statement. So if the path is already in our cache dictionary, which is shared between all instances of config, uh, we can return that value. 
if not, we can create a new value using the superclasses new method, and then return that. So now we essentially, it's not a singleton, this is actually kind of a pool of objects. Um, but we can do that without changing our interface, which again is, is cool. And I love that about Python, the fact that we can change what things really are internally without affecting the people who are relying on the interface of our code. So now we have one uh, that I seem to have called functions to methods. Ah, yes. Uh, so I actually call this the default instance pattern. Uh, and the idea is you've implemented top-level functions which rely on global state. Um, and this, this is the way I tend to write modules. I tend to start with functions. I much prefer a simple functional interface than, than classes. Um, but sometimes you get to this, this point where you've already got a lot of code relying on your methods, and then you need to do a bit of in, uh, you need some global state. And whenever you use the global keyword, you pretty much know you've made a mistake in terms of your interface. Uh, it's ripe for refactoring as a class. Um, so that's what we really want. We, want we've, we still want these, this top-level function, do the thing, to exist, but we don't want this global state anymore, especially if we want more than one instance um, of this kind of config thing happening um, and be able to do the thing on each of those. Um, we, we can't do that with this because you can't have multiple instances of a module. So again, this is much more of an object um, than a module. So what I've got here is we've, we've taken do the thing and we've extracted it out into a, into a new class called app. We've, we've put our, our method, in, well, it's now a method inside. Remember to add the self parameter. That's what I always forget when I'm doing this. Um, and then we've created an instance of it. So this is essentially default becomes our top level module, except that it's, it's obviously called default. We could make it private if we want to, but I quite like to make it public so that people can use this object explicitly. So they're referring to the default module, as it were. Um, and then what you can do is you can assign the bound method to a global variable inside the module. So every time this top level function is called, it's not actually a function. It's being called on the default object. And that's perfectly valid. Um, you could have a loop that goes through your class and automatically adds them to the top level scope. It's entirely up to you how you do this. So your users now have two ways to use this function. They can either, the, the old way, which is the top level function, which is now a method, um, or they can refer to your default object. They can migrate over to explicitly talking to your default object uh, and calling do the thing on that. Um, so this is good. We've replaced a function with a method. And you can do this in other languages in a way, um, but you often can't do it dynamically. You, can't, you couldn't loop through the attributes of the ob uh, objects and automatically add them to the top level scope. Um, but also, you pretty much need to write a function wrapper for each one that just calls into the default instance. It's, it's not very nice to write. I like the elegance of this, being able to assign um, methods to different scopes. And the final example I've got, I almost didn't put in to this talk. Um, it's really bad advice. Um, but I did it anyway because it's kind of it's interesting. It's, it's an interesting technique. It shows how flexible Python is. Uh, and I was kind of glad I did because the last time I gave this talk, uh, somebody from, that's a very popular social network, uh, came up to me and explained how internally they, they have a utility library that's used throughout their organization uh, and by many different people. And so they couldn't change the interface, but they wanted to. Um, so they did exactly this, what I'm about to show you. And every time he sees the implementation or remembers how it's done, he has a little cry to himself. So let's see how that's done. So I'm going to start. This is a similar example to uh, one of the previous ones. We, but this time, we've got a module with a global variable called salt with a value of 4, which, as we know, isn't the, the most secure value. So our requirements have changed, and we need this to be the current time. Um, so it's a very similar example to before. And before, we used property to replace it with a method. Um, but we can't replace it with a method because um, the property decorator only works on classes. And in Python 2, it only works on new style classes. Um, it, uses, it makes use of something called the descriptor protocol, which if you haven't heard of or you don't know how it works, I really recommend you Google for it and have a look in the core Python documentation. It's very readable, and it tells you what's really happening with attribute access in classes. But we can't use that here because this is a module. When you refer to the thing that's the importance, I've called it, important.salt, you're referring to a variable inside um, a module. So what we really want to do here is kind of replace the module with an object and with a property decorator and a method that generates our salt value. So I'm going to show you how to do that. 
it's four steps. So we need to create our class, which is going to be our module. It's going to be a fake module, but it is, in fact, the, the class. We're going, to create an, uh, we're going to add a property to it called salt. We're going to create an instance of the class, which will be specifically the module that's loaded. And then we are going to uh, insert that into the loaded modules in Python. So we're going to replace the, this module with, uh, with our instance. And the code looks like this. So we have a fake module, um, and it has a property. So that's the first two steps. Uh, we've called the property salt. So it is, in fact, you would access this as an attribute, salt. Then we create our instance of it. And then this sys modules dictionary, this is where all your modules go when you call import. And it's mutable, like pretty much everything in Python. Uh, the key is the name of the module as it was imported, uh, actually, actually as it was defined. Um, and then, but you can put anything you want in there. Uh, and in this case, uh, what happens the, in the order of the way this is loaded, the, before this code is executed, a new module is already inserted into this dictionary with our name. So in this case, it's fake. Um, and I'm just using that attribute to dynamically, um, dynamically look up the value and, and insert a new value. Um, so I don't recommend you use this in production code, but it has been used in production code, as I said. Uh, <laughs> And it kind of, again, it kind of shows you how flexible Python is. We can change modules with classes. Uh, you could actually, yeah, you could put anything in there. So there are further techniques. Um, you can change the way classes are created and initialized, as we've seen. Um, you can make objects that behave like iterators. Uh, you can make method calls uh, look like attribute access. So this is kind of uh, the, the way, this is the descriptor protocol. In fact, this is the way that properties work. Um, you can make classes that act like functions. So if you implement um, double underscore call, um, you can then call an object as if it was a function. So you can, you can replace almost anything with anything else in Python. Uh, and in terms of args and KW args, because we can use the asterisk and double asterisk operators, um, you can go from having a strictly defined list of arguments uh, to a function and move to something a bit more like argpass. So you could take old, an old set of parameters and still support that while also supporting a new set of parameters. There's a bunch of stuff you can, you can essentially pass your arguments as they're passed into your function. Um, so yeah, if you want to know more about this, uh, a lot of these use the double underscore magic methods, magic attributes. Um, the introduction on Dive into Python 3 is really good for this, um, very readable, uh, and will give you all sorts of terrible ideas for how to make your code more magic. So I've, I, you could argue that I've already shown you all the dangers. Uh, but um, there's, a, there's a bunch of risks when you're trying to keep your interface stable. As we've already discussed, there's no barrier between your code and your user's code. And all clever tricks, like the ones that I've shown you, have some risks attached to them. And it's up to you to weigh whether they're worth the risk. Your users may be expecting uh, a function to actually be a function. Um, and, and yeah, you, when you change these things, even though you're changing kind of background attributes, background behavior of things, um, you don't know what your users are relying on. So you, you may well, there may well be some problems with this. Um, the best you can do really in Python is to anticipate the way users use your code and optimize for that. And sometimes it's better, it's often actually better to break code than to use magic. But with these techniques used in isolated places, uh, it can be useful. Exceptions, as I said before, um, are a danger spot. Um, people often don't define exceptions very well. Uh, in more or less any function call I make in Python, I never really know what exceptions to expect. Um, when you're making HTTP requests, you might get an I.O. exception. Uh, same with loading a file. But th there's plenty of exceptions, more specific uh, and different circumstances that, that raise different exceptions that you haven't seen so often. Um, and we tend to just kind of catch them all at the top or not catch them at all. Um, but the, again, this is an issue for documentation. When you do know you're raising an exception from your code, document it so your users can prepare for it. Type assumptions are the biggest danger. Uh, we make all sorts of type assumptions all the time. Um, and often we're kind of led to. You, the documentation will say, this method accepts a list. And you'll think, oh, well, I don't have a list, but I have a generator. So, and you, you pass it in, and everything seems to be fine. Um, but you've actually broken the rules when you've done that. Um, if the person implementing that method adds a second loop in their code, uh, 
your, your method's not going to work. Your call to it isn't going to work anymore because you can only loop through a generator once, whereas li lists you can loop through many times. Um, so it, it's worth being quite specific about what you expect. Um, and also considering that if you've changed from an assumption that you're getting an iterator to changing to an assumption that you're getting a list, um, that you've actually broken backwards compatibility. Uh, and the best way around that, obviously, is uh, if you're trying to maintain compatibility, is wrap the generator with a call to list, so you actually have a list, uh, and then you can do all the stuff that you were doing before. But you need to think about these things. Monkey patching is always a risk. Uh, people might do this. Uh, they might even have a good reason to do it. I mean, ultimately, people need their code to work, uh, and if, if your library isn't doing what they need it to, Monkey patching may be a valid solution to that. Um, but I don't think you need to worry about it too much, because ultimately when people are reaching into your module and replacing stuff with other stuff, they have pretty much broken any agreement that you had with them. And there's no silver bullet. You will break client code, whether, no matter how much effort you put in, into it. There are so many subtle assumptions that we make when we're implementing our interfaces, about what our interfaces are. Um, and people are making the same assumptions on the other side, and there's always going to be a mismatch. But the, the, the key set of rules, if you want to maintain a stable library, are uh, know your interface, document it, test it, have a deprecation plan so your users know when you've broken stability. And um, it's worth knowing some tricks for maintaining compatibility in places where otherwise you wouldn't have a choice um, if these techniques weren't available to you. Uh, so the slides and the supporting code and a whole bunch of other supporting code is at this link uh, at the top of this slide. Um, if you don't want to come and have a chat with me in a minute, um, you can, but you have a question, you can uh, hit me up on Twitter, send me an email, um, and uh, yeah, come and talk to me about this, talk to me about Nexmo. Um, I actually like to talk to people, I just don't like talking to people from the stage. Uh, so thank you very much. <laughs>